Hello and welcome to this week's video of My Hero Academia. Today I'll be doing my next part in my What If Inka Midori Was a Pro Hero series. To learn more about the backstory to this in greater detail, check out the video in the description down below, as we're about to get into a brief recap. In the previous video, Inka Midori became a mid to low ranking hero, beloved in the neighbourhood and streets that she patrols but largely unknown on a national scale. With the help of her friends and family, she was able to balance her career with raising her son Izuku, who has grown up to become an aspiring hero, who, unbeknownst to her, has been inherited the power of one for all for the number one hero in Japan, All Might. Thanks to training and advice given to Izuku from Inko's friends and colleagues, he's become a skilled and talented future hero. However, when it came time to select where he would be going for his work placement, he didn't choose to work with his mother and instead decided to work under veteran hero Gran Torino. And it is there where we resume our story. Izuku's work placement would be an emotionally difficult time for Inko Midoriya. While she is proud of the progress that he's been making because he has made more than a little bit of an impression during his big debut at the UA tournament and on a grand to scale he's far stronger here than he is in at this point in the main timeline she would still be worried about his safety sure he's gonna be working and studying under a semi-retired hero and a very well respected one at that but accidents can happen and villains can happen too Given what we know of her personality, Inko would do her best to try and keep an eye on her son, but she wouldn't interfere too much, or at least she'd try not to. She'd do her utmost to respect his space, but ultimately would still go out of her way to check up on him at least once a day. Izuku would find this slightly embarrassing, as all teenage boys ultimately would end up doing, but he would still be thankful of the attention. Gran Torino, however, would be less than impressed. He wouldn't like just how much Inko mothers Izuku and would feel that her frequent appearances are getting in the way of his training. Which they would, but seriously not to the degree that it would end up as setting Izuku back too far. Gran Torino would of course also be worried that the true origins of Izuku's power might be revealed. I mean, they can only call it a superpower for so long, and the more the Inko hangs around, the more likely she is to twig that this is actually All Might's power that her son has. I can easily see an episode or two where it looks like she's going to find out the truth only for some kind of wacky shenanigans to get in the way and prevent her from seeing it. I'm sure that you can imagine those kind of scenes and moments in your mind because, let's be honest, they're kind of a little bit common in fiction. Beyond this series of events, this story remains more or less as it did in the main timeline. Izuku would gain a greater sense of control over his power than he did before, and you will remember that due to his prior hero training that he got from some of Inko's friends and from being able to get a bit more of a head start with All Might, he's a little bit farther along in terms of his overall power and his training than he was at this point in the main timeline. But let's be blunt here, don't imagine that him training under Gran Torino is going to push him to some kind of super level beyond. He's not going to be going Super Saiyan or Super Deco anytime soon, but he is going to have a far greater sense of control over his powers than he would have done at this point in the main timeline, which makes him, at the very least, less likely to severely hurt himself in the not too distant future. Future. Without coming up with some kind of original character villains and storylines for Inko to get involved with, her life during this time period will remain fairly standard, with her just patrolling the streets and dealing with whatever comes up. Any disasters, any accidents, any kind of minor villain stuff, she's going to be doing it because, well, that's her job. Of course, this isn't to say that it's going to be smooth sailing for her because, let's face it, there's a certain villain lurking in the shadows who is going to make life more than a little bit uh, dangerous for old Inko. As you'll be well aware, it is around this point in the main timeline where the hero killer's stain spree is brought into rather compelling focus. And providing that Inko being a hero in the first place didn't cause events to spiral and butterfly out of control to the point that Stain never became a villain or he was caught earlier, he stopped Inko earlier, he would still be out there cutting a path through anyone who he didn't see as being worthy of being a hero. And that could quite easily make Inko a potential target of his, because despite what some corners of the internet may think Stain really is just a madman with a knife who justifies his sprees through bullshit. All he needs to do is cook up a reason as to why she doesn't deserve to be a hero, no matter how insane or tenuous, and he will go out of his way to take her down one way or the other. And being a pro hero, Inko would be constantly on the lookout for him. However, in main canon, it doesn't seem like there was a concentrated effort to try and take Stain down until he attacked a more well known hero. Make of that what you will. So whilst he would still be an unwanted man, the manhunt for him wouldn't really have really begun on a major scale just yet, and it would need a little bit of a uh, 
a little bit of a push, if you understand what I mean. And this leads us on to a very difficult question, which is... Where does Inko Midoriya fit into the Hero Killer Stain arc? When it came to writing this series, as I've said in the past, I'm treating this less like a fan story and more like a case of alternate history. This is less about creating original characters, fan powers and original storylines, though hey, I'm sure there's an audience for that and maybe one day on this channel, but for the here and now, I'm looking at how a change in events could radically change the direction of the story as a whole in the most objective way possible, albeit with a little bit of creative flair an artistic license thrown in here and there to keep things interesting. However, to do this project justice, I have to look at things not just within the scope of the story, but outside of it, on a more metatextual and productional level. In the original story, it is Ingenium, the brother of Tenya, who is attacked and paralysed by Stain. This is a major dramatic moment that marks a shift in the wider tone and feeling of the series. As a writer, you want to do what is most dramatic and intriguing for the sake of your story and for the sake of your audience. And in a story where the main character's mother is a major recurring character and there's a serial killer on the loose, one who targets people like her, well, I'm sure you can guess what I'm implying here. So once again, we're left asking, where does Inko fit into the Stain arc? This leaves us, in my opinion, with four possibilities. Possibility number one, everything happens more or less as it did in canon. Inko isn't really involved, save for a little bit of an appearance in a scene here and there. Learning what her son did makes her less willing to let him go to the summer camp, and makes her far less willing to let him stay at the UA dorms when eventually they are built. But she ultimately agrees to it after a little bit more hard convincing. Honestly, I really don't like this as A, it makes the whole point of this video project moot as our subject does nothing. B, I don't like it because it would make her presence in the story up until this point make it feel like she's one of those player-generated characters in those video games where you can create a character and insert them into a pre-existing story. As such, I really can't fly with this one because whilst it is the most convenient and requires the less busy work, it's probably the most boring. So that brings us on to our next possibility. Possibility number two, Inko is attacked instead of Ingenium, but manages to defeat Stain. Given that she is the focus of this story, it makes sense that she'd get the win like this, but frankly, if I'm being brutally honest, dear listener, I don't like this possibility either, as A, that makes this entire project start to tread into OC Mary Sue territory, which I really don't like, and it starts to go against the whole alternate history feel that I'm going for with this. B, it does end up rendering this entire storyline moot, as she probably would have ended up solving it before it even began, and that leaves us with a very, very large gap in the story, with next to nothing to really fill it out, and C, and this is the more in-universe reason why I can't see it happening, frankly, she isn't going to be strong enough to take him down. To be fair, her quirk does put her in a far stronger position than I think a lot of people would expect, but given how very little we know about how her quirk works, it's hard to say if Stain's quirk would end up stopping it from triggering it or not, or if it would interfere with it, or maybe she can get around it and use it effortlessly like she's some kind of Jedi or something, but... Even if that's a possibility, I think it's fair to say that given her hero rank is as low as it is, it kind of implies that she's not especially strong or powerful, so I frankly can't see her being able to defeat him on her own. The only way that I could see a scenario like this working is if Inko is able to hold her own just long enough so that backup can arrive and to help her out, and at that point, Stain is either captured or he flees. If he's captured, well, that's the end of the storyline and we have to try and find something else to fill the gap. If he escapes, then he may remain a great threat in the background to a later part in the story, or he's tracked down and defeated more or less as he's in canon, or hey, maybe he remains at large just long enough that he can still have his fight with Ingenium. However, if he does end up getting into that fight, I have to say that in this series of events, Ingenium is probably in a far better state to get the win against Stain, as, let's be honest, his brother is friends with Stain's most recent potential victim and would have learned about Stain's quirk ahead of time, which would have ended up putting him in a far better state to get the win in. So at that point, let's be honest, this stops being a what if Inko was a pro hero and starts to become a what if Ingenian stopped Stain timeline, which, hey, maybe that's something I'll do at a later point, but for the here and now, uh, well, let's just put a pin in that one and just say it's a possibility, but hey ho, at least in the meantime, let's just say that Hey, Stain now thinks Ingenium's a real hero, so... win? 
Possibility number three. Inko is attacked and ends up like Ingenium, injured to the extent that she can't be a hero anymore, or at least not for the foreseeable future. Given that Inko isn't a big name like Ingenium, I can't see the manhunt being expanded quite as far as it is in the main timeline. In this case, this means that Izuku will be out for a revenge instead of tenure. In this scenario, it's hard to say how it's successful or not he would end up being, as it's really hard to determine whether or not he would have any backup, and if he did have backup, then who is it going to end up being? And that itself could end up impacting how well or not they end up doing in a fight against Stain. However, if the timing is more or less the same as it is in the main timeline, I could end up seeing something similar happening there, where at the very least he's backed up by Shoto. It's hard to say where Tenya might be in all of this, and he'd at the very least be most likely still be doing his work placement with his brother, and hey, if Tenya's there to intervene with it, it does mean that Ingenium's going to be there as well, so that adds yet another hero into the mix of things, so... I think it's fair to say in this series of events that Stain is probably going to go down and it's probably going to be pretty blooming painful. However, I can easily end up seeing a scenario where even if they do defeat Stain, the punishment against Azuko is going to be far stricter than it was in the main timeline, providing of course Ingenium doesn't end up cooking for him, providing that he was involved in all this to begin with. I can't see Izuku getting kicked out of the school, but, you know, he's not going to be off with a little bit of a warning and a lecture. I could honestly see a possibility where he ends up having to do community service as a result of this. And the possibilities of that are pretty hard to fathom, as it could end up amounting to a little bit more than just something that happens in the background that's never really touched upon. It could end up setting up for a filler arc, or it could end up setting up for an arc that could end up radically changing his worldview, depending on how the writer ends up wanting to roll with it. This timeline feels a little bit more reasonable, but it does end up setting up for a little bit more of a potentially vengeful Izuku, which, I'll be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure how I want to feel about that, especially bearing in mind what happens into the fourth possibility. Possibility number four. Inko is killed by Stain, and things go horribly, horribly wrong from there. Despite the best efforts by All Might and the rest of the staff at UA, the hunt for Stain remains more or less on par with what it was before. As I've mentioned previously, because of her hero rank, I can't see a man hunt the scale of which we saw in the main timeline from really happening. Because quite frankly, she isn't famous enough to really warrant that. Izuku would end up seeing this as being a betrayal of his mother's legacy. And given that everything that she did for law and order and the people that she defended, he would be honestly heartbroken that at the end it didn't really seem to matter all that much and he worries that even if Stain could be caught he could still escape again or one day be let out of prison just to continue this spree once again. As a result of this Izuku goes on the hunt for Stain himself and given how reckless he can be he does this alone. In this timeline, Izuku wouldn't know about Stain's quirk until it's far too late, and without any backup he becomes yet another victim of him, and as a result of this, All Might is forced to find a new successor, but only after he's found and arrested Stain himself, a fight which may well burn through the remaining power and physical strength that All Might has left within him, which itself would leave him incredibly vulnerable for a future fight with All For One. This of course is providing he hadn't passed on his power ahead of time. If he hadn't, well there's a good possibility at that point that if the two of them ended up fighting, the All For One could end up getting that power. If he had passed on his power before then, well his successor might not get the train that he needs to fully utilise and use that power, which would end up meaning that they would be fighting with a major disadvantage at a later point in the story, one that they may never be able to overcome and recover from if All For One's plans are able to come to full fruition. Alternatively, Midoriya is able to find and defeat Stain, either beating him to the point that he won't be a threat to anyone anymore, or just, well, outright killing him in the most brutal way possible. The fact that he ended up breaking such a taboo is something that he would never be able to truly recover from. Even if he feels nothing for Stain, even if he thinks he's the absolute scum of the earth, an absolute lowlife, a hateful demonic creature, he would still be heartbroken that he did something that his mother would never be able to approve of, and did something that All Might would never be able to truly forgive, no matter how much nice words he ends up saying towards him. This makes a fall to the Dark Deku concept all the more likely. Whenever it does end up happening, I can't see him being brought back, which as I've said in another video, is not a good thing, no matter how cool or badass that costume may end up looking. If there's one positive from this timeline, it's that Izuku may be more insistent in being involved with the team that attacks the hospital, where Tomura is at a later part in the story. And he would use this position to stop 
Tomura from ever waking up. How he stops him, I'll leave up to your imagination. This would end up meaning that all for one's plans would be thwarted, and that he would eventually end up getting defeated, if not by Midoriya, then by some successor of his down the line, one that would end up growing to continue Izuku's vision of rather definitive justice. With all those possibilities in mind, I think that for the sake of this story, I feel that Inko being attacked but surviving is the best option. She doesn't defeat Stain, but Stain is unable to injure her to quite the same extent that he does with Ingenium in the main timeline. As the fight between them is going on, Ingenium overhears it and goes in to try and save the day, but regretfully once again fails. However, unlike the main timeline, he's only seriously injured, not severely injured. He will walk again, just not for quite a while. So regretfully, he's not going to be saving the day anytime soon. If you want to add an extra layer of foreshadowing and dramatic irony, it could be that Endeavor is the one that finds the pair of them, with Stain having been scared off the moment he saw Ceres back up arriving. If this happens, then things remain largely as they did in the main canon, however with a few differences here and there. For a start, there would be a greater sense of animosity between Tenya and Izuku. Tenya would resent the fact that Izuku's mother got off far better out of all of this. Yes, she's still injured, but still not to the same extent that his brother is in this particular scenario and he would end up blaming her for not calling back up or fleeing at the first chance and jump getting rather than going hog wild and trying to take down a villain that she never had any hope in being able to defeat. Izuku would do his best to try and calm things down between the two of them but it wouldn't be enough and Tenya would seek revenge for what happened to his brother. However, given that Inko survives with fewer injuries overall, she's able to warn everyone ahead of time about Stain's power. She would tell this to Tenya and the others in the hope of convincing them not to to go after Stain and to let the pros deal with him. Naturally, Tenyu doesn't listen to this and instead decides to use this information for himself. He has his hero costume modified so it's stronger and more stab and knife resistant. A prototype is made as the people making it assume that he's just having it made out of some kind of sense of trauma or PTSD over what happened with his brother. They don't end up doing it however that he's wanting to have it done for the sake of revenge. They make a prototype and this prototype is, well, stolen by Tenya as he uses it to try and get revenge. However, said prototype is less mobile than his usual suit, with extra areas of armour and padding and able to protect him. So while Stain isn't able to cut into him and trap him so easily, regretfully for Tenya, it's hard of him to put out of a good fight, something that undermines any advantage they end up having when the two of them end up meeting. And really, let's be honest, all Stain needs to do is find some weak point here or there, and the moment that Tenya is vulnerable, that's going to be the end for him. But thankfully here for him, because things are mostly going like the Iron Cannon, Izuku and Shoto are able to show up to stop things going south, and together the three of them are able to take down Stain once and for all. Whilst Tenya's suit didn't really help him win, it did wear down Stain a little bit more than he would have done in the main timeline, which does make the fight against him a little bit easier, but still not so easy that they can treat it as a cakewalk. Though of course this does mean that when punishments are being doled out, Tenya does get bollocked a lot more in this timeline than he did within the main one because he ended up stealing a very expensive prototype from the school. He won't get thrown out, but suffice it to say, Oh boy, they're not going to be happy with him. On a similar note, Inko is not going to be happy about the fact that Izuku got involved with all of this. Whilst he may protest that he felt that it was in the name of the greater good, given the trauma that she still has from going all through all of this, she will be absolutely crushed and heartbroken that her only son could be so reckless to do all of this. And she would end up determining that she that Izuku has learned all the wrong lessons from Gran Torino and that she needs to keep a closer eye on him and will be far more insistent on him working with her on any future or remaining work placement stuff that he has coming down the line and would do her absolute damnedest to chaperone any future trips that Izuku's class ends up happening. But that is a story for another time. I'm sorry that this story, this episode as a whole, covers far less than the previous one did. We only really discussed one plot thread, only really discussed one storyline here, which I will admit was a little bit less focused on Inko, but 
let's be honest, there's a lot of metaphorical luggage to juggle about here. The work placement and hero killer stain arcs are focused almost exclusively on Tenya, on Izuku, and some of the other characters thrown in here and there, and finding ways in which Inko could have been involved with all of that without forcing her into the action was really difficult for me. But in the end, I decided to do this in the way that would involve her as much as possible without making her presence in the storyline feel tenuous or without her overstaying her welcome. Because, let's be honest, even though she wasn't directly involved in much of what was happening, this was a very difficult time for her. Over the course of this series of events, she's gone from a proud parent, just really on the ultimate high of seeing her kid doing really, really great and being a bloody nice chip off the old block, to being rather heartbroken that her son almost got himself killed fighting a villain that she herself could not stop. Sentiments which are likely to roll over to the next episode, whenever that might end up being. Possibly after this next coming season, or unless this gets some kind of major explosion of likes and subscriptions and demands for it to be continued, well it may be done sooner, but hey, we don't know what the future holds, so with all that said and done, I want to say thank you all for watching, thank you all for listening, and see you next time. Goodbye! Thanks for watching, be sure to like, favourite, subscribe, click the bell, and do all the YouTubey stuff that YouTube wants you to do. Go on, it'll do me a power of good. Until next time, my friends, goodbye!